toward a new understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. Above all, the memory of this Christmas celebration will make an impression with sharp traits on many souls, for one can hardly think of a sharper mental contrast to our present time than the one that arises when we raise our souls to the voice that sounded out to the shepherds, presenting an eternal truth for all human exaltation in the age following Christ. Divine revelation in the heights and peace to human beings on earth who are of good will. Truly, no greater contrast exists than when we raise our souls to peace on earth and then consider the reality which we find spread out over the horizon of a great part of the educated world today. Precisely because of this contrast, the Christmas celebration we are now experiencing will be an emblem for human hearts across the earth which will long remain in memory. If we can indeed maintain what we have to maintain on the field of our spiritual scientific thought, inner uprightness of heart and inner truth of soul, we truly cannot celebrate this Christmas with the same feelings as we have celebrated other Christmas tides, for it must urge us to deep reflection. <clears throat> it must urge us most especially to reflect on what emerges from spiritual scientific meditation as the idea of our human future, on what, therefore, can lead people's hearts back to times that are not like our own. We have, in the course of the years, inscribed a great deal into our souls that can point us in the direction of the kind of constitution of soul that such times brought about. What is it, then, that we must feel is still so severely lacking in the present? When we call before our soul's eyes what has often formed the heart of our considerations, we see that, still missing in the depths of the human soul, is the recognition of the truth of what entered the world on the day we commemorate every year in this winter night of celebration. The whole significance, the whole profundity that transpired at the time this, the winter night of celebration, reminds us of is expressed, truly not in vain and with deep significance, in the saying that earthly humanity has always regarded as the most haunting of all. One might say, in the saying, quote, divine revelation in the heights and peace to human beings on earth who are of good will. Close quote. The simplest thing is often the most difficult for human hearts to understand. As simple as this saying sounds to us, we do well to get a clearer and clearer idea that all coming times of earthly existence will be able to understand it more and more deeply and to live their way into its important words. The appearance of the Jesus child entering into earthly life on the holy night of Christmas has not become the most popular part of the mysterious story of the appearance of Christ Jesus on earth in vain. With it we can place something before the human soul that it can take up with love, something we can place even in the heart of the smallest child, insofar as that child can receive the external sense impressions, even if not with words. It is something that sinks deeply into the depths of the soul, where love flows through the human being most gently but at the same time with the strongest, most warming powers. In truth, earthly humanity is still no further advanced than the childish conception of the secret of Jesus Christ and will continue to wilt away in epoch after epoch until the human soul once again wins the strength through which it can absorb the entire greatness of the beginning of the mystery of Golgotha. Therefore, this year, I will not reflect on Christmas as in other years. Rather, let me bring before your souls something that can indicate how much we still lack of the depth necessary to allow the mystery of Golgotha to glow in our souls as it should. We have, particularly in the last year, 
often spoken about how actually, on the basis of our spiritual scientific research, we must celebrate the appearance not only of one Jesus child, but of two Jesus children. And it may be said that with what has revealed itself to us through the spiritual scientific contemplation of this secret of the two Jesus children, a weak beginning to a new understanding of the mystery of Golgotha has been made. Only slowly and gradually can this mystery take hold of people's minds. How it moves into human minds can come before our souls when we look, for example, at the fact that to a certain extent what Christians of today have gained in the contemplation of the Christmas child was won through a struggle which went from east to west through other conceptions of a divine meditator between the highest divine spiritual beings and the human soul. We have also often looked at how in parallel with the current of Christian life moving from east to west, another current of revelation flowed more in the north, north of the Black Sea along the Danube, upward along the Rhine into western Europe. This cult, which we know as the cult of Mithras, disappeared in the first centuries of the Christian era. But by that time it had taken hold of just as many hearts as Christianity itself and had made a deep impression and spread in the regions of Central and Eastern Europe. Mithras appeared to those who declared themselves his followers as just as great and sublime a divine intermediary who had descended from the spiritual heights into earthly existence as Christ appeared to Christians. Just as we hear how the entrance of Mithras into earthly existence was celebrated in the holy winter evening of the shortest day, so also we hear that shepherds first heard of his revelation. Sunday was dedicated to him, just like the Christian holy day. And when we ask what is characteristic about the descent of this Mithras figure, we must say that Mithras could not be conceived as Christ was conceived in Jesus. The consciousness was present that when one represented Mithras externally in a figure, the representation can only be an external symbolic conception, for the true Mithras was only to be seen by those who had clairvoyant vision. True, he was conceived as the mediator between the spirits of the higher hierarchies and the human soul, but he was not conceived in such a way that he incarnated in a human being. He was conceived as descending to earth, but in his true nature, not in the image in which everyone could see him, but in his true nature. He was visible only to initiates, to those who had clairvoyant vision. In the cult of Mithras, the idea was not yet present that a divine spiritual being, conceived as the intermediary between the spirits of the higher hierarchies and the human soul, incarnates in an earthly body, for the cult of Mithras rested on the ancient primitive clairvoyance, which was still present in a great number of people. When we investigate the path the Mithras cult followed from east to west, we find that a great many of those who became servants of Mithras could themselves see in the intermediary circumstances between sleeping and waking when the soul lives in dreams, and could see in spiritual reality the actual descent of Mithras from eon to eon, from stage to stage, from the spiritual worlds down to earth. Others were carried along by these seers. Many could bear witness that such an intermediary had been given to people, but he was an intermediary belonging to the spiritual worlds. What those in the cult of Mithras possessed was in fact an external, more or less pictorial representation of what the seers beheld. What is it really that confronts us in the Mithraic cult? We must not think that something was known about Christ only after the mystery of Golgotha. This follows from our whole world view. The initiates of the mysteries and their pupils even in pre-Christian times, had known Christ well as the Spirit who would come for humanity. 
the initiates referred to him as the High Sun Spirit, and they saw him coming down from the spiritual heights, approaching the earth in order to set up his dwelling there. They designated him as the future and the coming one. They knew him in their spirit and saw him making his descent. Then came the mystery of Golgotha. We know what it means. We know that through the mystery of Golgotha, the spirit through which the earth has received its meaning entered into a human body. We know that since then this Christ spirit is bound with the earth. And we also know how humanity should develop in order to behold once again in the not too distant future the Christ Spirit who united his life with the life of earthly humanity through the mystery of Golgotha. We are not saying something untrue when we say that what the ancient initiates saw as the various cult sites of the spiritual is to be recognized since then as penetrating, flowing through, pulsing through, weaving through earthly life. But the ability of clairvoyant knowledge to see into the spiritual spheres had increasingly to disappear in order for this clairvoyant knowledge to see the Christ after he had descended to earth to those who were supposed to recognize that the earth not only contains human love but is also pulsed through with divine love which will reveal itself more and more as the highest treasure to earthly human beings. So people should properly feel that they have received in their earthly house the great gift of cosmic love, the Christ, from the God whom one calls God the Father. They should properly recognize Him as the being who from then on should be bound to the deeds and with the whole meaning of earthly evolution. They should properly recognize Him in His life from his first breath as a child to the greatest deed that can be revealed to human hearts through the mystery of Golgotha. It was indeed still possible for us in the course of recent times to fill in through the fifth gospel the gap that has remained in the four other gospels. Indeed, it has been granted to our time to become acquainted even more exactly with every step of this life of God on earth. People should become as familiar with Christ Jesus as with one of their brothers. For such a being traveled from the wide spiritual realms into the narrow valley of earth out of love for human beings. And because human beings should get to know him in the most familiar intimate acquaintance, the human mind's forces of knowledge and love had to be collected for a while in order to behold in pure human divine closeness what transpired among people at the beginning of a new age, the Christian age. The forces in human beings had to be wholly concentrated and directed to the life of Christ Jesus. So, for a while, they had to be directed away from gazing up into the spiritual spheres toward what has come into the child of Bethlehem, what has come down from the cosmic heights. Today, however, we live in a time when our gaze must be broadened, when human progress and human salvation should really rule the earth. Also, what Christ Jesus was in the body of Jesus of Nazareth must be broadened into the divine spiritual heights from which he descended to the life of the earth. The cult of Mithras was something like a final powerful recollection of the Christ, still not yet arrived on earth, but descending. Then it was granted humanity to comprehend the Christ ever more intimately in the soul, so that this comprehension was possible even for the smallest child, but in such a way that together with it went a draining away of the old way of looking up with a clairvoyant gaze toward the heights from which Christ descended. 
And it is through the contemplation of these heights that we know Christ is a cosmic being and also know what value he has for the narrow valley of earth. Slowly and gradually this gazing upward into the cosmic expanses in which Christ can appear to human beings as a cosmic being drained away. The cult of Mithras was a powerful echo of the ancient knowledge of the super-terrestrial Christ. Then we see how, in a way, clairvoyant knowledge gradually drained away, diminished, even for those who still had clairvoyant knowledge in the old style a draining away of the clairvoyant capabilities occurred. And with this draining away, the possibility also ceased of knowing Christ entirely in his true essence, of knowing him not only in his earthly human effect, but also in his whole heavenly glory. More and more the possibility of seeing Christ in his heavenly glory beside his earthly existence disappeared. We see how what still lived in the cult of Mithras appears already weakened, in spite of the noble greatness that the corresponding doctrine contains, in the person whose name we have often mentioned, the founder of Manichaeism. Mani directs us toward Jesus, but because ancient clairvoyance was still present in this spirit who founded Manichaeism, it is not the sort of reference we find in a simple primitive faithful soul. The understanding of the mystery of Golgotha is not yet what it can be for the present. For Mani, Christ Jesus was a being who had not really assumed earthly human incarnation, but rather lived on earth only in an apparent body, in an etheric body. We see the struggle in Manichaeism to understand the mystery of Golgotha. Why did this struggle take place? Because it was still possible for the founder of Manichaeism to look into the spiritual heights, to see how the spiritual being, the Christ being, descended. However, the possibility was not yet available to really understand how this spiritual being penetrates into the earthly world, how it actually takes up residence in a human body. A struggle of the soul was first necessary before this full understanding was possible. We see once again also that the doctrine of the Manichaeans spread from east to west, a doctrine that on the one hand still looked to the divine spirit descending, looked toward everything the old world view still had, looked not only at the physical beings who offer themselves to human sensual eyes, but also at the beings who travel through the universe as star beings. On the other hand, the connected chain of human fate, of human life, permeated the souls of the Manichaeans with this cosmic life. The question struck deep roots in them, Quote, how is the evil that exercises power in human life to be unified with the work of a good God? Close quote. Manichaeism looked deeply, very deeply, into the riddle of evil. However, this riddle of evil can come before the eye of our soul in its profundity when we are in a position to understand it in connection with the mystery of Golgotha, when we permeate the mystery of Golgotha with the riddle of evil as Manichaeism also strove to do. Hence the struggle of the remnant of ancient clairvoyant knowledge with the problem of evil, with the riddle of evil in Manichaeism. And in truth, precisely the people who were called to devote their souls most deeply and intensively to the understanding of the mystery of Golgotha have struggled with what still sent its glow into more recent times from the remnants of ancient clairvoyant knowledge. We need only to think of a great teacher of the West, St. Augustine. Before he struggled through to the understanding of Pauline Christianity, he was devoted to the doctrine of the Manichaeans. Pauline Christianity made an even greater impression on him when he was able to perceive that the divine mediator had descended from the divine spiritual spheres from eon to eon. 
Even in the earliest times of his struggle, this spiritual vision illuminated for Augustine the knowledge of how Christ took up dwelling on earth in a body of flesh, and how the riddle of evil is solved with the mystery of Golgotha. It is striking to see how Augustine held dialogues with Faustus, the renowned bishop of the Manichaeans, and actually only turned away from Manichaeism and to Pauline Christianity because Faustus could not make the necessary impression on him. Then we see draining away what we can call the mystery of the super-terrestrial Christ, as he was before the mystery of Golgotha, and basically the remnants of the ancient clairvoyant knowledge vanished completely with the emergence of the new age of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. <clears throat> this ancient clairvoyant knowledge still knew the heavenly Christ beside the earthly Christ. One could obviously still also feel this heavenly Christ in the beginnings of Christianity, but to have a vision, an intelligent vision, of how he descended was only possible for the old clairvoyant knowledge. It must touch us deeply when we perceive how in the earliest times of the dissemination of Christianity those who still took their knowledge from the ancient visionaries wanted to make Christ present to themselves, how in order to recognize Christ they not only looked to Bethlehem but gazed up into the heavenly spheres in order to see how he descended from there to bring salvation to humankind. We know that besides the Mithras cult, besides Manichaeism, Gnosis was present in the West. It too wanted to link, as at least as far as it was Christian Gnosis, the descent of Christ from divine spheres, from eon to eon, with the knowledge of the earthly life of Christ Jesus. But it is striking to see how the human mind wanted to concentrate more and more on the contemplation of the merely earthly life of Christ Jesus. It is striking to see how the simple human mind, which did not have the ancient clairvoyance to show the life of Jesus, was almost afraid of the grandiose idea of the Christ descending from the heavenly heights. The first Christians were fully unconscious of the ideas that Gnosis still possessed. They were afraid of those ideas. Still, into our time, a certain fear is present with those who, although deeply touched by the mystery of Golgotha, cannot pull themselves up to that recognition of the Spirit. Fear that the mind can enter a state of chaos if one can see what spiritual knowledge dwells in the doctrines of the Gnostics. However, what the Gnostics can still say about the heavenly Christ beside the earthly Christ is indeed very moving for us and the gaze of our souls becomes in no way duller toward the earthly life of Christ Jesus if he is raised up now through new clairvoyance to the spiritual heights where the heavenly Christ is to be found and from where he has descended. Then it touches us so very deeply when Gnosis relates, quote, Jesus said, Look there, O Father, how this being on earth of all evil the goal and sacrifice far from thy breath wanders. Look, it flees bitter chaos, helpless, how it should find its way through. Therefore send me, O Father, bearing the seal I descend, I stride through the host of eons, every holy teaching I unfold, showing then the portrait of the gods. And so I give you of the holy path deep hidden lore. Gnosis is its name for you. Close quote. We feel that the new spiritual science must lead us once again to the point where we can in our contemplation weave around the Christ event the spiritual aura that, for reasons we have already explained quite often, and to which we have found it necessary to allude once again today, had to be lost for humanity for a while. We must do this slowly and gradually. 
We must, to a certain extent, try to grasp what spiritual science can reveal in such a way that the human mind, which is today still far from spiritual science, is able to understand. For that reason, an attempt has been made to put basically the entire anthroposophical wisdom about the Christ event, specifically about Christmas and its connection with the human soul, in these simple words. Quote, in the soul's eyes reflected the world's light of hope. Wisdom, devoted to the spirit, speaks in human hearts. The Father's eternal love sends the Son to earth, who in grace on human's path sheds the glow of heaven. Close quote. Hopefully the time will come for evolution on earth, when one will be able to say more, much more, and in clearer words about the secret of Golgotha, in simple words for the whole world that can express for all of humanity what spiritual science has to say about the mystery of Golgotha. Indeed, we see how, until the end of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, even until the beginning of the fifth, ancient clairvoyant knowledge was drawing away, so that the last remnant still granted to human souls was subject to contempt. We see this disturbingly embodied in the form that appeared in Europe, particularly in the draining away of the fourth post-Atlantean period, and much more widely than is thought, the form of the folkloric adventurer, for he has become an adventurer, who could still carry the contemporary last remnants of clairvoyant knowledge. The popular books call him Magister Georgius Sibelicus, Faustus Junior, Fons Necromanticorum, Astrologus, Magus Secundus, Chiromanticus, Aromanticus, Pyromanticus, In Hydra Arta Secundus. These are the words of the complete title of that Faust in the 16th century, who represented the ancient clairvoyance as it was fading out entirely, who still had a view into the spiritual worlds even if it was somewhat chaotic. Then in more recent times it emerged that the human soul is no longer granted when it puts itself passively into certain situations as in ancient times to see spiritually, but rather can only see passively the sensual and what the mind can put together from the sensual. The whole tragedy of recent spiritual vision was expressed in the simple accounts about Faust the Younger. Basically, he refers to himself in his titles in such a way that we can recognize that he is the last offshoot of those who could still look into the spheres from which Christ descended. He called himself Faust the Younger, a clear Ill allusion to the old Faust, the Manichaean Bishop Faustus, the teacher of Augustine who still possessed what Augustine yearned for. Indeed, the writings of Augustine were never so widely distributed in, in Europe as in the time when the sagas of Faust the Younger came into being. Moreover, he called himself Magus Secundus, alluding to Magus Primus, who, for those who look into these affairs, was still there as one who looked out with a clairvoyant gaze and reached up to the heavenly spheres. And whom those who only wanted to acknowledge and concentrate on the earthly life of Christ Jesus feared. In calling himself Magus Secundus, Faust refers to the ancient Simon Magus, the Magus Primus. However, he also refers to yet another man, whom we indeed know of from our spiritual scientific observations, and whose gaze was directed upward into the spiritual world. Faustus also calls himself in Hydra Arta Secundus, referring to Pythagoras, who in olden times was called Primus in this field of art. We see the last flickering sunset of what was ancient clairvoyance, and we see how this ancient clairvoyance became incomprehensible to people, and what Augustine yearned for from Faustus Senior, and how he then became acquainted with the doctrine of Faustus Senior as we are told, through an old man and physician, truly came to pass in what is presented to us so grippingly in the Faust saga. Just so, we encounter Faustus Jr. in the popular saga. 
The old man appears there as well, and warns Faustus Jr., but he has already made his pact and handed over his legacy to Dr. Wagner. And truly, when we look over the ages at what has been handed down as vision of a spiritual world since the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, we must say that it is the legacy handed over to Dr. Wagner. For it all hangs on how one can manage such an inheritance. In the case of Faust, it is still a gazing into the spiritual worlds. In the case of Wagner, it is something that only rummages around in parchments, looks back at old times, and is basically quite rightly characterized with the words, quote, One is desirous of treasures and is content when he finds earthworms. Close quote. That is the materialistic worldview of our recent age. And it is no wonder that in this materialistic worldview any vision of the Christ of heaven has been lost, or that a fear of the expansion of the image on which the earth forces should concentrate is still present today. But we also know that earthly humanity will lose all understanding of this image if it is incapable of weaving through a new spiritual view a new aura around the so gripping image of the Christmas child and of his growth over thirty-three earthly years. Spiritual science will be called to sharpen the sight of human souls again for the Christ of heaven beside the earthly Christ. Then the Christ will be recognized in such a way that for all future ages on earth He can never be lost again for human progress and human salvation. When wisdom presses upward again into spiritual heights, where the fire of love also burns in divine spheres, then the human soul will not lose again what people can win through Christ Jesus. All that is wonderful, all that penetrates into the deepest forces of love. However, the eternal will be one as well. What additionally must be one will be one if the development of humanity proceeds in the appropriate way. What we are able to say today is that nonetheless the modern sources of a knowledge of the Spirit have truly opened and that one does well in the symbol of the Christmas festival. Those who live themselves properly into what our spiritual scientific knowledge still is today will find that a deep, deep humility overcomes their soul. We may only feel a presentiment of what spiritual science should become for humanity at some time in the future, for what we are able to know about it today can only do justice to what will one day be given to humanity when much, much time will have flowed by as from the very young Jesus child to the adult Jesus Christ. Today we have in our newly beginning spiritual science first the child, hence the Christmas celebration is so properly our celebration, and we sense that we live today in a deep, dark winter night in respect to what can reign as human light in the development of the earth, and that with our present knowledge we really stand before something that reveals itself to us in the deep winter darkness of the evolution of the earth, just as the shepherds once stood before the Christ child who first revealed himself to them. In respect to the understanding of Christ Jesus, we can adjust ourselves as the shepherds of long ago and so properly pray that the sources of spiritual life may always flow more and more generously for human beings properly pray that they may evermore realize divine revelation in the spiritual heights and grant the peace that this revelation can give to human souls who are truly of good will. This Christmas celebration in particular then appears to us as an emblem. We know little still of what depth of spiritual science the world will have one day. We feel a presentiment of what may, of what may be yet to come. We feel it in deep humility. However little, when we are willing to let it properly penetrate our heart, ah, what it looks like to us then. Looking over the Europe of today, what do the nations think about one another? How do the nations, one and the other, look for the blame for what is happening? 
if spirit knowledge truly inscribes itself into our souls, we will understand the blame sought by one nation in another. In truth, someone has this blame, and he is, enti- and he is really entirely international, directing his steps from nation to nation. But we speak of him only in the circles of those in whose hearts a little spiritual science has come. There we speak of Araman, the so properly international being, who in alliance with Lucifer has the true blame. You do not find him if you always direct your gaze toward the others, but only if you seek the paths of knowledge in self-knowledge. There it goes down below into the depths of chaos. Then we feel him, this Araman. But when we recognize him correctly and learn to understand him in the context of what the mystery of Golgotha can be for us, the annunciation of the revelation of wisdom in the heights and of peace in the depths of the valley of earth, then we get a sense of the whole fire of love that can radiate from the mystery of Golgotha and does not know the boundaries that have been erected between nations and peoples. A great deal exists in what has already appeared before our souls as spiritual science. But if we direct our attention to what has been revealed already before this chaotic present day of ours, and what has now found such a deeply disturbing, sad and tragic expression, we find how very small is the dwelling of the soul in which the new understanding of the Christmas child who came to earth must live today. Did not this Christmas child have to appear to poor shepherds? Did not he have to be born in a stall, hidden from what ruled the world in that time? And is that not once again so for the new understanding of what is connected with the mystery of Golgotha? Is not what appears to us outside in the world infinitely far from this understanding in the world at the beginning of our time reckoning? from what revealed itself to the shepherds when they heard, quote, divine revelation in the heights and peace on earth to people of good will, quote. Let us celebrate, my dear friends, this Christmas tide of the renewed Christ understanding in our hearts and in our souls. Let us feel ourselves, if we want to celebrate a proper Christmas, like those shepherds far away from what fills the world now, But through what is revealed to us as shepherds, let us recognize what necessarily had to be recognized back then. Let us recognize the promise of a certain future. And let us build up in our souls the trust in the fulfillment of this promise, the trust that what we feel today, like the child we wish to worship, the new Christ understanding is this child, will grow, will live and will develop, in not such a long time, in such a way that the etherically manifesting Christ can incarnate into it, as the Christ could incarnate in the body of flesh at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. Let us fill ourselves with the light that through trust in this promise can illuminate us into the innermost depths of the soul. Let us warm ourselves with the warmth that can pulse through our souls. If we feel the relation to the spiritual heights in which the light of that spiritual world can appear before our intuitive souls, then alone can we be certain that it will one day brighten the world. If we think like this, then we are making, precisely in this difficult, painful time, a real Christmas celebration. For not only is the deep, dark winter night of the season present, The result of our harmonic darkness is there, on the horizon of nations, as it has gradually come up since the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. Just as the Annunciation of Christ first came only to the shepherds and then increasingly filled the world, so the new understanding of the mystery of Golgotha will increasingly fill the world, and times will come that will dissolve the winter darkness we live in today. They will be times of light, for human beings as well. Let us, let us feel ourselves like shepherds in relation to what is still a child, in relation to the new Christ understanding, and let us feel that we can pulse through, pulse 
through in all humility with a new sense the saying that not only should endure within the progress of the development of the earth, but should become increasingly more significant. Let us unite ourselves, not only with the mind, but also with raised consciousness, in the saying so full of promise in this Christmas season, divine revelation in spiritual lights, peace, peace, more and more, to all human souls on earth who are of good will.